Our next speaker, Dr. Walchuk, is the Chief of Melanoma and Immunotherapy at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He's going to share with us how a new system of looking at the body is changing how cancer is treated all over the world. I was delighted to hear about him a few months ago and even more delighted that he agreed to speak with us today. Please help me welcome Dr. Walchuk. to uh, spend a few minutes talking to you about a new way to treat cancer. But cancer is a word that evokes this very negative, visceral response in most people. Um, it conjures up images of a, a potentially fatal illness, which affects almost every family um, and is about to surpass heart disease as the number one cause of death in the United States. Now the good news is that many people with cancer uh, can be cured, and many have been cured. And this is largely due to early diagnosis and refinements in surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and a new form of treatment called targeted therapy. But the truth is we still don't have adequate solutions for many people with cancer. There's still a lot of work to do. And in addition, cancer leaves us with deep emotional and physical scars, both for patients and families. So clearly, we need better answers. Most of the efforts of scientists and physicians over the past five or six decades have been dedicated to treating the cancer, the tumor. And more specifically, they've been focused on interfering with the incessant cell division that characterizes cancer, the really desire of the cancer cell to make more of itself. And that's really the genesis for what we call chemotherapy, with most of those medicines being designed to interfere with the process of cell division. And in fact, a newer form of treatment called targeted therapy, uh, which interferes with the signals that happen inside the cancer cell to tell it to divide. It's the basis for radiation therapy as well. And certainly, we've made a lot of progress in these areas. But what we don't often think about is that there's another way to treat cancer. And it's, in fact, inside our own body. It's our immune system. And what I'd like to take some time to explain to you is how we can use the immune system to treat cancer. What do we know about the immune system? We know that it is a collection of cells and organs inside our body that protects us from dangerous pathogens, bacteria and viruses. And it does that very well. But we don't often think about the immune system as being a weapon against cancer. And that's really where we're going to go. So in thinking about how we might use the immune system to treat cancer, we have to imagine why the immune system doesn't recognize cancer as being another source of invasive danger to our bodies. Why doesn't the immune system automatically reject tumors the same way it would reject a mismatched organ? And in thinking about how to introduce this concept of cancer and immune suppression, I thought back to an analogy that my mentor, Dr. Lloyd Old, once made about cancer being juxtaposed to a successful pregnancy. And when you think about it, many of the same skills that a successful pregnancy needs, cancer needs as well. The cells need to divide quickly and grow quickly. The cancer and the developing fetus both need a rich blood supply to support them. The placenta needs to learn how to burrow deep into the uterine wall and invade. So do cancer cells to get access to the circulation and spread. And most relevantly, cancers need to cloak themselves from the immune system. And this is just like the fetus needing to be hidden from the mother's immune system because it is, in fact, a different person. 
And so in studying this over many years, scientists have learned the mechanisms underlying immune suppression, whether it's relevant to a developing fetus or a cancer, and have in fact identified several ways in which cancers can hide themselves from the immune system. And in fact, that is an evolutionary trick that cancers have used to ensure their own survival. So one way is actually quite simple. Uh, cancers can build fibrous walls or capsules around themselves, which act as a physical barrier uh, to the invading immune cells that are coming to attack it. Cancers can also make immune suppressive hormones, which turn off the immune system. And most intriguingly, cancers can in fact attract populations of immune cells, not the good ones that would get rid of the cancer, but in fact inhibitory immune cells that normally regulate the immune system. And these cells are also relevant in the context of the developing fetus. And so by studying these processes carefully over the past few years, we've learned a tremendous amount about what regulates the immune system at a molecular level. What are the mechanisms underlying immune suppression? What are the molecules involved in turning the immune system on and off? Oh wait, why would we want to turn the immune system off normally? What's the purpose of the off switch for the immune system? It's actually quite simple if we think about diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis. Those are diseases of a hyperactivated immune system. And they're diseases where these off switches don't function properly. And so we really need to understand that there are on switches and off switches to the immune system, and these are different molecules, and we now know what they are. And so in developing new ways to use the immune system to treat cancer, we have learned at a very precise level how to manipulate these on and off switches. And in doing so, we have opened the door to try and get the immune system hyperactivated for a temporary period of time so that it can actually see cancer. The paradigm that I'd like to introduce is that we need to treat the person and the cancer. We've spent a long time studying how to treat the cancer. Now it's time to remember how to treat the person. So this is uh, a CAT scan of a, of a patient that I was asked to see in uh, 2004. And at the time, she was a 24-year-old woman who just graduated from college. She had her whole life ahead of her. And as she says, most people get a car uh, or a very nice gift as a graduation present. She got melanoma. She got metastatic melanoma, which is the most lethal form of skin cancer, um, and it had actually spread to her lungs. And what the green crosshairs are showing you here are, is a melanoma tumor that spread from her skin into her lungs, and then just one of many that she had. And so this is back in 2004. We did the best we could. We treated her with several different kinds of chemotherapy to treat the cancer. We gave her radiation therapy for the melanoma that appeared in her brain, uh, but in fact, she still was getting quite ill. And quite desperate, um, in a wheelchair and appearing quite pale, she said, what else can you do for me? And I said, well, we have these new medicines that are meant to disinhibit the immune system, to cut the molecular breaks that hold the immune system back. Maybe we should try one of those medicines. And so as part of a clinical trial of a new medicine, uh, which at the time didn't have a name, it was called MZX010, it sounds more like a car than a medicine, um, she was randomly assigned to receive this new immunotherapy. And she received four doses of this new immunotherapy, which today goes by the name of ipilimumab, um, and that's it. She received four doses of that, and we hope for the best. And this is Sharon today. Okay, so uh, in 2004, almost 10 years later, she has no cancer that's detectable in her body. She hasn't received any treatment since 2005. Um, she's had two babies. She runs marathons, and apparently she likes dogs. <laughs> um, and she and 
thousands of others have told us quite a bit about the power of the immune system to treat this disease. Uh, the trial that she was on led to the approval of this immunotherapy as the first treatment ever to extend survival in patients with metastatic melanoma. In fact, 20% of people with this very difficult illness live more than three years treated with this medicine. That may not sound like a big number, that 20% number, but put it in the context of the fact that before medicines like this, the average life expectancy of someone like Sharon was about six or seven months. And so her success, as well as many others, have opened the doors to the idea that we can treat the person and the cancer, and that we now have multiple different medicines that seem to be able to turn on the immune system in a meaningful way. And treatments like this are now available all over the world. That medicine, ipilimumab, is licensed in numerous countries to treat melanoma. And other medicines are close behind in late stages of clinical development. Not just to treat melanoma, but also to treat other cancers, like kidney cancer, lung cancer, and several others which are in earlier stages of development. And so what we've learned is that the immune system is a very powerful weapon right inside our own bodies, which is able, under the proper circumstances, when it's modulated with very sophisticated medicines, to treat the cancer and, more importantly, treat the patient. We just need to, co to continue to remember that we have a very powerful weapon inside our own bodies and that that is the immune system. And the future of cancer treatment, in my estimation, is going to be based upon building combinations of therapies around this. Because the immune system, remember, uh, conveys durability to the response. I told you that Sharon has not received any treatment since 2005. That stands in stark contrast to temporary regressions, which can happen after chemotherapy. The durability of the responses seen after immunotherapy are expected, because the immune system is a living, dynamic organ inside our bodies that has, in fact, a molecular memory. We're vaccinated as babies against many different infectious diseases, and our bodies remember those responses for decades. We don't need to be boosted. So there are immune cells in these patients' bodies that remember the cancer in case it should rear its head again. And that is really the goal, not temporary remissions, but durable regressions of this otherwise fatal illness. And that is why I and many of my colleagues now believe that the future of cancer medicine is going to be built upon immunotherapy being integrated into the conventional cancer treatments that I described to you earlier. Combinations of immunotherapies with each other, with radiation, with chemotherapy, with hormonal therapy, and with targeted pathway inhibitors. The future of cancer treatment is looking very bright. We just have to remember this very powerful weapon deep inside us.